Are we live? Let's, uh, we'll get started. Um, <laughs> thank you all for uh, joining us. Uh, and uh, I just want to introduce, uh, have everybody uh, start over. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm excited to be here. And I'm excited to be joining you on what I am informed. It has been an amazing couple days of uh, conversation and workshops of uh, thinking about matters that are really important to this country, not just now, but uh, for our continued existence. So uh, I'm grateful to be here. We uh, have a, my name is Van Newkirk and I am a senior editor at The Atlantic. And I am also host of the podcast Floodlines. Uh, which talks a little bit about uh, disaster. Um, it's about uh, Hurricane Katrina. And actually for that podcast, I've interviewed a couple folks who will be uh, joining me on this panel today. Uh, most of us are all here, so I think it's good for us to go ahead and get started. Um, with us, we have Flozell Daniels, uh, who's president and CEO of Foundation for Louisiana, and is a public policy and community engagement strategist uh, and um, has accomplished a whole bunch in the state, um, has led more than $50 million of uh, award-winning community investment strategies while at, the, while at the foundation and has thought deeply about what recovery uh, means, what sustainability means, and, and how we're looking at uh, keeping communities resilient for the future. So, Zell, thank you. Great, thanks for having me, Ben. We also have uh, Jim Elliott, and Jim is a professor of sociology at Rice University. And his research focuses on urbanization, social inequality, and the environment. Um, he served as an advisor to the sociology program at the National Science Foundation and as co-editor of Sociological Perspectives. Uh, and he's co-authored a book uh, with Scott Frickle, uh, which we've actually leaned on pretty extensively for the podcast, which was Sites Unseen, Uncovering Hidden Hazards in American Cities. Um, so thank you for joining us, Jim. Yeah, thanks, Van. We also have with us uh, Pam Jenkins. And uh, Pam is a professor of sociology and faculty in the Women's Studies program at the University of New Orleans uh, and a faculty member of UNO's Center for Hazards Assessment, Response, and Technology. Uh, and for my own personal interest, uh, Pam was maybe our bedrock in the show for understanding exactly all the ways we were wrong about what recovery meant, um, about uh, what the shape of uh, New Orleans and the Gulf Coast, how they have changed uh, pre and post Katrina and was a fundamentally amazing asset uh, for us and for I think the world for understanding uh, disasters, for understanding uh, the ways that uh, vulnerable people are affected by them. And uh, her book with Steve Kroll Smith and Vern Baxter, Left to Chance, uh, was just a phenomenal text. So thank you for joining us, Pam. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And also, I believe on the way, uh, we have a General Russell Honoree, a man who to this group probably needs no introduction. But I will give him an introduction when he joins us. Oh, there he is. Uh, while we're waiting for video and audio, uh, General Honoree is uh, a native of Lakeland, Louisiana. Um, he was commissioned as second lieutenant of infantry, infantry and, uh, uh, in 1971. Uh, he was a command, uh, he was the leader of Joint Task Force Katrina, um, leading the DOD response to hurricanes Katrina and Rita in Alabama, Mississippi and Louisiana, uh, and uh, has been a vital voice in our national conversations uh, before and after Katrina on understanding disasters, understanding um, how they work, understanding climate change and understanding sustainability and building a green economy of the future. So we are very grateful uh, for your voice on the podcast, General, and we're grateful to have you here with us today. All right, so what we wanted to do to start was just to get a, 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 a Everybody here has a Katrina story. You were all directly uh, <laughs> involved in, uh, in the disaster and, and thinking about it in, in the aftermath. So I want to hear from each of you uh, a little bit about that story and uh, give, just give an introduction about yourselves and what it is you think we should be focusing on today. Let's start uh, with Fozel. Hey guys, thanks for having me. It's just fantastic. It's really great uh, to be with you, Van. And and of course, uh, Pam and uh, General Lamaray and, and Jim, 
Um, you know, my Katrina story is, is like many. I'm born and raised here in New Orleans. By the time Katrina hit in 2005, I've had a chance to uh, go to school and, and graduate school here at the University of New Orleans and Tulane University. I'd had a chance to work across the state and really get to know Louisiana's amazing people at the community level. And also had a family that was deeply rooted across the region, um, both here in Louisiana and Mississippi. And so it won't surprise you that my, my part of my experience was the tremendous loss. We all lost all of our properties, um, whether it was rental or home ownership, uh, significant hardship with regard to economic disparities and uh, the challenges that people in my family and in my friendship circles had uh, to respond to this. Um, and then to get to be a part of a leadership team, first at Tulane University, then at the then Louisiana Disaster Recovery Foundation, uh, to really be a part of this moment in history. And we sort of find ourselves in another moment in history where we get to not only think about a response that's efficient and efficacious and thoughtful and, um, and responsible, but we get to think about a response and a recovery that would do something that we hadn't seen in this generation. And that was a way of interrogating equity and inclusion, um, a way of thinking about how we can take this moment and create something out of it that we did not have before. And we weren't sure we could do. If something was broken and we were gonna fix it, if we were gonna rebuild it, if, if we were gonna recover it, what's the opportunity to do so in a way that everyone in Louisiana would get a chance uh, to live the kind of life that they wanted to live. And so um, we focused on, and I, I think this still has merit, this idea of economic dignity. We wanted to make sure that people could wake up every day and take care of themselves and their families. Um, we focused on having access to decision-making. So making sure that people who were already leaders in their communities had the skills and the training the ability to have an impact or influence on the decisions that most impacted them and their families. Um, and we focused on building out practices that were commensurate with respect for the communities that we say we were serving, making sure that we in fact were serving them, making sure that we were thinking about and interrogating our power in a way that we are in relationship with them so that we can actually get the outcomes that we wanted uh, to see. So there was a really amazing, um, for me, a match of my own love and affection for this community and for its people and finding a way to be inside of the work that I was privileged enough to be inside of uh, to mount strategies that would meet the moment um, and that would match what people needed. In, in those days, we called um, our subline at the foundation was Louisiana's Fund for Louisiana's People. And as we approach the 15 year anniversary here in, in, in September for the foundation, we're thinking a lot about that and about uh, this amazing journey we've been on and how that experience still informs our way of thinking and our way of acting in and with Louisiana. Allison Bird in the uh, comments says, uh, love the term economic dignity. And I have to say, I agree. That's a good one. Um, I think it's, it's, it's powerful. We think it's fundamental to democracy in America. We could talk some more about that, but yeah. I want to swing over that introduction question to Jim now. Uh, you know, just your Katrina story and uh, one thing you, you wish that we understood better about uh, that disaster and disaster is 15 years later. Yeah, thanks, Van. I want to thank Lori and everybody else on the panel and Flozell for all the hard work you've been doing. It's amazing. Uh, so when Katrina hit, I was a newly tenured professor at Tulane. So I was in the city and my wife was considered essential personnel at one of the local hospitals. And so I went and during the storm sheltered there and volunteered at the hospital where I think uh, Van did a great job in floodlines of sort of talking about that eye of the storm, you know, where information was scarce and the stress was high as the water started to flow in. And I remember waking up that next morning, or not really waking up, uh, we never went to sleep, but sort of thinking we got through it. And then someone went out for a walk and said, the water's coming. And so that was a surprise. So when we finally helped get the patients out of the hospital a few days later and got them on a bus, sliding them down, uh, mattresses down the stairwell because the elevators weren't functioning, um, you know, 
left town making a commitment that when I came back, I really needed to get students involved, uh, documenting and sort of figuring out what was going on in the city because it didn't seem like the resources were going to be there. So dove into the uh, disaster literature, hadn't studied that before. I'd studied urban inequalities and such and came back and partner with someone at Xavier. So we, we partnered a Tulane student and a Xavier student to go out into different neighborhoods and begin to interview and talk to folks about, you know, those who were coming back, what their experiences were. And since leaving Tulane, um, I can't say leaving New Orleans because I always feel like I'm attached there and want to go back whenever I can. But since leaving the institution, have continued that line of research and really thinking about long-term recoveries and the idea that it is recoveries, plural that there's not just one. And again, I think Van does a great job of illuminating that. Um, and each one of these different types of recoveries is embedded within this highly unequal society, right? So we've got these unequal recoveries going on and each one has these long tail effects. And so in recent research with colleagues like Junior Howe, the University of Pittsburgh, you know, one of the things we've been trying to think about in research is how do those tail effects play out over time after the curfews are lifted after the military leaves, um, you know, once the master plan has been drafted, once people stop thinking about those immediate concerns and really finding stuff that surprised us. We had a suspicion that over the long term when we're using this longitudinal data, I can talk about more later, uh, finding out that, um, you know, there are these divisions where people of color especially um, lose assets and wealth, the types of things that will buffer them and help with that economic dignity that Flozell was talking about and get themselves through, you know, that declines. The bigger the disaster, the bigger the cost, the more that wealth recedes. And the more FEMA gets involved, invests in long-term infrastructure, the more that's true. And what surprises us is that the opposite is true generally for white folks, especially white property owners, that their wealth goes up. And so the system is working for them in some respect. There's trauma, no doubt, and I don't want to minimize that, but the system seems to work. So the urgency of shifting that uh, system and taking into account some of these um, needs for dignity and the supports for that and the empowerment, um, I think need more direct attention. So I think that's one of the things we need to talk about. It seems like the more researchers that I talk to who uh, have done uh, work on modern disasters, especially Katrina, the, the more I'm coming to the, to the realization that uh, it seems to have disrupted and changed so many folks' careers and uh, career objectives. Uh, it seems the entire field took something of a, of a turn around Katrina and under, understanding of it. I mean, I'm talking to, I think, a lot of testaments to that. Is that would that be your, your assessment too? Right, you know, if you answer, ask those questions to a professor, I'm sure Pam could probably give a long story as well. Um, the short answer is yes. I think a lot of people felt a calling and a duty to uh, bring their expertise and their privilege, so to speak, to the issue uh, and do it in different ways. So people will do it in different ways. My way has been trying to develop national context and to show that New Orleans and Katrina is an example of these larger ongoing issues across the country that we need to deal with. And so that's opened up a conversation we might get into, but it resonates with the visual images and the podcast and the human stories, Van, that you've been so great at revealing. So those together, I think really happen. I don't know how you stumbled onto this. I'm sure there's some personal, sounds like history there. So I think all of us sort of come to that and people who care about justice and equity issues, um, I think see this as a pivotal moment. I like to tell folks I'm from the, uh the first FEMA trailer town, uh, Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, Hurricane Floyd, 1999. Oh. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, there was an, an innate interest in thinking about Katrina. Um, I was in high school when it happened. It was six years after uh, Floyd. So um, it, it, it made sense to me. It was sort of like the, the story that made things come into to view for me. Um, Pam, I want to take our introductory question to you. Uh, we talked a lot about this in your house, uh, probably like right where you're sitting uh, for the uh, podcast before. But um, you're, you have so many amazing uh, stories about uh, the flood and, and you're coming back to the city. Uh, one that um, helps us understand what we are missing about 
that uh, disaster 15 years later. Thank you, Van, and it was a great pleasure to be part of your project, I have to say. And to, and it's a great pleasure to be here today with the rest of these panelists. I'm very humbled by it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Katrina for me personally, and then to where it drove me to think about research questions for just a minute. So 15 years ago, my husband and I lost mostly everything in, as the water in the city rose to meet the water in Lake Pontchartrain, flooding our home and 80% of the city. I stand in privilege in that disaster. In the long road to get home, 18 months, nine dwellings, I still stood in privilege. I had insurance, my job, friends, family, community, and most of all, what I had was the ability to work through the bureaucracy. And so I thought, two years ago, I thought I was done with Katrina. I had no more to say about Katrina. And of course that was not true. And <laughs> Van, your project is a good example of that, but every, probably every three or four months, I do something else about Katrina. And I am writing a longer piece about it now, but the storm, when the storm began, it began my long and others, Jim's, Flozell's, the general's, long liminal moment of where I am both subject and object of the, of the experience. I talk to folk about their experience. Other people talk to me about my experience. I interview folk about what it's like 15 years later. Van, you came to my house and talked to me. So this liminal place still exists 15 years later. But what I really took away from some of the work that we did was this idea that when we talked to people, what they said was, I had to rely on myself and my neighbors and my community, that we were on our own. I cannot tell you of the hundreds of people I interviewed, how many people said that, I am on my own. It was a disaster where all levels of government failed as Jim and Flozell have talked about. And we learned as well, and I think this is really important, is that while there was aid available, there was not aid that was accessible. So story after story, we heard about people trying to get help as, it was, as if it was just beyond their grasp. So people would tell me it wasn't the water that, made, that did me in, it was the aid afterward that did me in. Katrina showed us that met what many of us know, the depth of inequality in our city and on the Gulf Coast. Some of that inequality has been mitigated and you have two architect, architects of that mitigation, General Ronaway and Flozell Daniels on this panel today. But the inequality still exists and I would argue that with the exception of a few of us, we are asking the wrong questions. Katrina taught us that through death and tragedy, that the inequality prior to Katrina was enhanced by the disaster. And so it made me think, and, and Jim, you'll know this book, that old Robert Lynn book, Knowledge for What? The Place of Social Science in American Culture that we all read at graduate school. And so I think our question about policy and planning and response and recovery should be for whom? and for what. Um, and I wanna close with just this little piece from my research. In the first round of research, which we did over five years with the same folks, they all said they felt and thought they were abandoned. The sense of abandonment, which I think is crucial in our understanding that they were abandoned by their government and now when I talk to people in the COVID, they feel and think that they are expendable. And I think we have to examine this continuum from Katrina to the COVID and all the places in between. Yeah, I think uh, that made me think about uh, something else. It's coming in through, through the chat from Lorna, uh, talking about the similarity between Katrina and Maria. I mean, you know, now we're talking about COVID, but uh, your your research brought me back uh, to to days on the island right after Maria hit, um, and and seeing people tell me verbatim the thing they felt most 
it wasn't the necessarily the grief or the bereavement of, of losing things. It was the abandonment, the betrayal. Uh, and also remember us talking about the beams in your house <laughs> and the choice to, to rebuild. So uh, thank you. Thank you again. Uh, I want to take our introduction now to General Honoré. Uh, again, a person who does not need an introduction, <laughs> but we will do it anyways. Uh, just wanted to um, to hear about uh, some of your own Katrina stories, and one thing you wish uh, people understood better about it 15 years later. Well, I think uh, we, we've got the luxury now of looking back almost 15 years. <clears throat> the story has changed yet it has remained the same as this story go from what was the news to now history. I first became uh, woke to this concept of news to history when I was in my senior year at Southern University, uh, about to graduate and go off in the army in an English lit class that I had taken for the second time. <clears throat> And Dr. Marshall asked us what we thought about Vietnam. And we all mumbled into it. And I was looking at going to Vietnam, probably being there within 12 months. And we all thought about it and gave our best answers. He said, we really won't know until this become history. And I think we'll, we're at that reflection point now as we look back at Katrina to be able to, uh, Start looking at it from a historical perspective. It wasn't until a couple of years ago that McNamara really told the story of how they manipulated the government to stay engaged in Vietnam as he was uh, in his waning years. It became history. And it was no longer personal from, or nothing for him to have to protect. I think one of the observations I would say from my war stories as we transition from Katrina to Harvey to Irma to Maria and now to the wildfires in California and now the pandemic is that <clears throat> a thing that the expectation of people that the government is going to be there Johnny on the spot to fix things. The reason it's a disaster is that people died and we lost infrastructure. That's why it's a disaster. There's no such thing as a well-managed disaster. <laughs> we need to get that out of our head. <laughs> if, if it was well-managed, it wasn't a damn disaster. <laughs> you hear me? It was an inconvenience. There's no such thing as it. Boy, we handled that disaster well. You know, uh, nobody got hurt. Uh, none of the water got in. All the houses stood up. That was broke. We fixed it back better than it was. There's no such thing as a perfect response to a disaster. Because a disaster like war, the first fatality is the truth. Because the politicians try to put uh, we're doing everything we can. And there might be. Because a disaster has a vote. That's why it's a disaster. And it spans throughout the history of our country. And it could go back to uh, ancient history. During a disaster and immediately following it, we can say we're going to do better the next time, but in a real disaster, did we do better in Harvey? No. We didn't even evacuate the city. Okay? Did we do better in Irma? Kind of, but Irma didn't. Only put 9,000 people out of electricity. Did some damage in, uh, in Key West, but spy spared Miami. Did we do better in Maria? No, we went back with it, Maria, in the response. Because the attitude was, 
uh, we'll use the federal uh, agencies as opposed to calling in the Department of Defense. I was in New Orleans in three days. It took seven days to announce a general to go to Maria. So each disaster, the reason I, we, we've got to get people to understand that they've got to become as much as possible invested in their own survival is that in a real disaster we lose and the government will be there, but it will very seldom meet our expectations of flying us off in a beautiful airplane and taking us to a, a condo up in Colorado to hang out and be told when the, your home is rebuilt. It doesn't work that way. And the bottom side of that, I think what it's taught me is that in a disaster, the poor get poor and the rich get richer. And the most impacted people in a disaster, whether it's a hurricane, a flood, or a pandemic, is the poor. Uh, who gets hotter in the heat when we have a heat wave? The poor. Who get colder in the cold weather when we have a blizzard? The poor. Who floods more when the floods come? The poor. So that being said, what Katrina taught this generation, because this has been learned before, is that these disasters have tremendous economic exposure, uh, infrastructure exposure that could have probably been done better, and the response uh, that probably could have been done better. But the acceptance that you're in a disaster and that everything is going to be done fairly or equitably is, is a place we have not seen yet. We thought when the uh, Messiah arrived and the BP oil well hit, we wouldn't have any problems. You understand? Him and the golden folks from out west knew how to handle a disaster. They screwed BP up. Okay, we still don't have that sorted out. 11 of our people dead, nobody went to jail. We thought with Flint water that this would all go away, that we knew how to handle disasters, it didn't happen. Flint still won't have water. So what I'm telling you, it, 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 it transcends political uh, parties and what numbers in the White House. The disasters defeat us. And we don't get better until we figure out at that point that the disaster beat us. Now let's figure out how we're going to defeat the disaster. <laughs> and that's our play organizations like what Flozell lead and what the university professors and organizations like this try to help people figure out how, how can we build, how can we be better prepared the next time and how can we uh, make sure people are better prepared, but people need to understand in a disaster we lose. We, we spent $114 billion on, in, in New Orleans on levees. Those levees, all it takes is another foot of water, they'll break again. The city can flood again. So you either got a choice. You either take the risk or you leave. And many of us down there rather than take that risk and stay and, and hopefully we'll be able to evacuate on time and be able to help those who want to come back home. Well, that's all I got to say about that to quote the great Forrest Gump. <laughs> see, we have some, uh, so how I know you, uh, General Honorary, is uh, I am the, again, the host and reporter for the podcast Floodlines. We have so many sound bites I want to share with, with everybody here from the show. Um, uh, I don't know what our uh, leeway is on, on cussing, though, so I want to make sure we, uh, we ease into the cussing a little bit. Um, but I do have one uh, clip uh, from a young woman who was 14 uh, when uh, the flood came, uh, Leanne Williams. And I think that clip uh, talking about her actual re-entry uh, to the city uh, after uh, she was displaced helps orient a lot of my thinking about uh, what we'll be talking about today. So I'm gonna play that. I'm gonna hope this uh, sh 
uh, screen share is successful. Um, if not, feel free to laugh at me. Let's see. All right, there we go. Um, there we are. Getting into New Orleans that day, it might have seemed like things were going back to normal. Just off I-10, the roof was back. Oops. The Saints were playing there again, and they just signed Leanne's favorite player, Drew Brees. Here we are. And here it is, the opening of the Louisiana Superdome, the grand opening right now through 13 months of labor, pain, tears, and sorrow. The casinos were booming. The business district was coming back. And this town's coming back. This town is better today than it was yesterday, and it's gonna be better tomorrow than it was today. People were partying on Bourbon Street. And that is a shot of the French Quarter tonight. It is crowded, tourists visiting, very much alive, that part of the city. And I gotta tell you, the French Quarter is cleaner than I have ever seen it in my entire life. They've hired a new company. Before Katrina, Leanne had lived in the Lafitte housing projects with her mom and dad. The bricks had been around for over 60 years, some of the first public housing for black folks in the country, but they were still closed when she got back. The federal government had been trying to shut them down for years. They were trying to get rid of all the big housing projects in the city. The problem was that a lot of people lived there, but after the flood, residents were scattered across the country and the city saw an opportunity. In 2007, the city council held a meeting to vote on a plan to demolish four of the biggest housing projects, Magnolia, Calliope, St. Bernard, and Lafitte. Protesters showed up to try to stop it. The scene outside of City Hall was chaos. Protesters pushed against police, surged against the doors of City Hall, but they were barricaded. Only a few people could see what was going on inside. Let the people in! Let the people in! Inside, Supporters and opponents of the demolition argued for two and a half hours. It would be a violation of human rights to conduct wholesale demolition of public housing. I believe that the past model of public housing in this city has been a failed one. Who said that we want our homes demolished? What, what, who said that? The city in we the situation by ignoring it have let our public housing developments in ruin and put down. Let me tell you something. You try to take away our homes, our pride, our self-respect, our dignity, but we refuse to let you take it. We're going to continue to fight back. But the arguments in favor of demolishing the projects were winning. The mayor himself had written a letter in favor of demolition. The federal government was promising a lot of money to build new mixed income units. City officials argued they could beautify the city and find a way to house everyone who'd left. Change is hard. And in New Orleans, it's even harder. Those of us who are sitting here today, we were elected to be fair and to use our own life experiences and love for this city to help guide us in difficult decisions like we have to make. A course which, a course which will make New Orleans great again, not only for the few, but for the all. The scene outside the chambers got more and more chaotic. Police pepper sprayed and tasered people in the crowd. They tasered protesters who made it inside too. They tasered! Stop it! Inside, the vote went down calmly. It was unanimous in favor of demolition. In a few weeks, the bulldozers would move in and start knocking down 4,500 apartments. We couldn't come back home. And that just brought me all the way down. They just shut it down. Couldn't come back. And I don't know why. Many families who lived in those projects never came back. Rents rose in the city by almost 50% in two years. In some places, it doubled. All right. That was... Uh... Uh, segment in which uh, again Leanne Williams, who was a teenager who lived in Lafitte, came uh, came back to the city and uh, really the, uh, the beginning of what has been a lifelong housing and stability uh, for her and for other folks like her uh, began with that return. Um, I was interested in this clip because Pam, we talked about uh, that <laughs> city hall meeting 
at length. Um, and I keep thinking about it because I keep thinking about this idea of uh, sort of the question of who is making decisions when it comes to recovery, the question of who is involved. And uh, when we talk about multiple recoveries, that uh, empowerment or lack thereof seems to be such a big part of it. Um, and I wanted to ask you, Pam, uh, if there were any, if you had any uh, sort of uh, visceral response to hearing it again or thinking about it again, and what you think about that in the framework of multiple recoveries. Well, I, I want to hear too what the rest of the panel thinks. I think, Van, it's really important you put that clip in and that you found it. Um, I was sitting in my FEMA trailer, I think, watching television and not being there and weeping watching this happen. Dean Charles from Suno and the Reverend Dr. Marshall Truehill were the last two people to speak at that meeting. And both of these people had spent their lives working for change in New Orleans. And it was like they let them speak and then they took the vote. It was the, as I talked to you about, it was the neoliberal response to disaster. Mm -hmm. They had a theory about if you spread the poverty around, things will change. It was just a complete d disregard of the voices of the people who live there. And then the other thing that I did was drive around these housing projects as they tore them down and take pictures and you'd see people's belongings just hanging out of windows and, and on the streets. And I know what that felt like because that's what I did with my belongings. And I can't get over, <clears throat> I don't think in my life I will get over that moment or the tearing down of people's homes. It, um, you know, Van, it is hard listening to it. It, it really, um, wow. You, you know, after all these years, you think you're, um, you're immune to this stuff. We, we do this stuff every day. But what you really had was an example, really as good an example as you can come up with or imagine, you could not make this up that in the middle of a disaster, when we're trying to recover a historic community, we would take people's homes from them. And to be clear, the story was a lie. They said, well, but, but listen, we're going to get something better for you, which, which really says a few things. One is, um, and we're going to speak in plain terms uh, today, because why not? Um, which, which really saying to poor Black people who had been historically marginalized by policy, by decisions that were made to marginalize them on racial lines and on, on class lines, you're then going to say, I, I know what's better for you and your family and I'm going to create a space for you that is going to improve your outcome in this recovery. And it was a lie. Their wealth did not increase. There's a lot of really amazing conversation in the chat about how do you get to this economic dignity? Well, one of the ways we know this in America is ownership and access to land and housing and at least affordability. The other thing that didn't happen is they did not take into account because they never asked anyone what would happen to the family networks that they were dependent on to be able to make it through the impoverished lives that they were leading, which you could not see. And this happens, I heard this from our friends in Houston. I've heard this from our, our colleagues in, in Puerto Rico and, and all the other places the general mentioned um, as well is they didn't take into account that those families were proximal to each other. They were watching each other's kids. They were sharing each other's food. They were helping each other with their, with their light bill. They were looking out for each other's elders and young children, right? There were networks there that were beyond family, blood family at least. And what we actually did was we dispersed those people into dangerous environments all across as small a city as New Orleans is, when you don't have access to the people that help you live a safe and dignified life, it actually disrupts the opportunity for a recovery. 
that is commensurate with what we thought was in our hearts. Right? I think it's a, it's a permanent lesson for us to learn in this work as we think about what did Katrina show us? It's one of the primary lessons. It's really hard to, to absorb all this, to absorb these points. Just thinking about, you know, at least my own personal experience, knowing what those networks, what they do, and what, you know, I, I can't imagine uh, going back to school or doing any of those things as a teenager without those networks in place, right? And I, yeah, I know, uh, Lori, who helped to put all this together, has you know she does some did some of the seminal work on thinking about children mm -hmm. um, and teenagers. They went through all this, uh, and you know her work helped me understand <laughs> my own life in a bit. Uh, I want to bring Jim in on this because uh, you have done really great work helping me understand uh, what Flozell was just talking about, which is um, the 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 aspects of, of wealth how they affect your ability to withstand, how they, how actually, uh, not just the ability to withstand and resilience, how disasters exacerbate wealth inequality and actually in some cases make it so where wealthy folks can come out ahead while the poor folks uh, are always behind the eight ball. So I want you to talk about that research and, and um, how we can uh, apply it to our thinking today. Thanks, Van. And that was a powerful clip. I, I remember being in the city during those hearings. And for those of you who have not looked on YouTube, there is video of it as well. And it's just as disturbing as you can imagine. And I just want to loop back uh, to what General Honoré was talking about, how the news becomes history. And I think that's a really interesting thing to think about. And he also mentioned before that how things change, but they didn't. And this is a case, I think, with that displacement in the public housing communities where the history became news. And part of the problem is that we weren't going back to what uh, Van called in his podcast very eloquently, the antediluvial, the, the before aspects and these divisions. And I think it gets back to, I mean, how I got on to the research uh, that Van's mentioned about wealth, which is, you know, I wasn't a disaster scholar. I, I, Katrina got me reading. I stayed up at late uh, after I evacuated trying to figure things out. And I was shocked. There were thousands and thousands of studies out there already since the 1950s. And almost all of them were about emergency response, the first 72 hours of what happened. And there was really very little, if any, empirical work on long-term recovery, which is what housing and economic dignity are all about. And that was a real problem to me because if you're gonna take a people-centered approach where wealth becomes the issue, then long-term recovery seems to be what it's all about, right? That's what we should have been focusing on. In addition to the preparedness, I understand that we need to manage and prepare, and I'm not saying we don't, but we needed to look long-term on what our goals were in that. And so in thinking through that research, one of the things that I just wanted to come back to with respect to wealth and assets is just the observation that Flozell made. It's that, you know, these inequities, um, don't just hamper recovery, they hamper adaptation. So I don't know how many of you remember the green dot map fiasco in what was eventually called the time, sometimes pick a union, right? Because it was coming out only three days a week instead of seven days a week. Um, but here it was, a plan comes out to say, hey, we don't want people in harm's way. This doesn't make sense. We want to empower communities, we want equity, but here's the map, here are the dots on where we're gonna get people out of harm's way and it's good for them. And that basically took the wealth that they had, um, communities who didn't own much, but owned their social capital, their connections, and basically said, you're not gonna have that anymore. And so when you take that away, you take away the trust and you feel abandoned and you don't deal with those inequities over which these new planning initiatives and land use plans are overlaid, you're not gonna be able to plan better for the future. So we're gonna end up digging this hole that's deeper for the next time the water comes and fill in. And for me, just thinking more broadly about it, it comes back to how we deal with recoveries and wealth. And we're very much about restoring property and not restoring communities. And that means that the people with the most property get the most restored. It's not based on need. So we need to rebalance that in this recovery framework and economic dignity. We've got this slanted hillside we're at the top of the hill, we start the disaster recovery, thinking we've got all this concrete 
or in this case, recovery resources. And at the top, there are well-meaning people trying to push for equity and try to do the right thing. Lots of folks who are at this conference doing that thing, but then we pour that money onto the slope and it slides down to the private sector because the local jurisdiction just doesn't have the wherewithal and the resources to get things done. So they harness the recovery to the private sector. That private sector effectively strips the well-meaning intentions of inclusion and the property rights begin to predominate. And what we need to do to balance that and get better at adapting and recovering is to rebalance the property right with the rights of inclusion. Mm -hmm. and really privilege the need, not the loss. Um, as important as the losses are and as traumatic as it is for folks who have more to lose some of that stuff, we need to rethink how we do that. Yeah. So that's where wealth came in. How do you begin to invest in communities and empower them uh, in a way that generates wealth, in a way that respects the, the wealth that they already have socially, but gives that social infrastructure the resources it needs to rebuild. Yeah, I want to follow up. Well, actually, Flozell, you were jumping in. I'm gonna let you. Well, I, I just really, really appreciate what Jim just said. Uh, uh, particularly this, this really clear statement that you know those with property get, get recovery and those without don't. Um, one of the things that we learned pretty quickly was that the other place um, that's really important to pay attention to is where planning bodies exist to make sure that there's a way to infiltrate those processes and, and push people into them, right? One of the first things the foundation did, and we continue to do this, is to both use our position and our grant making strategies to make sure that people are included in New Orleans case in the city master plan process, which hadn't been done in more than 50 years. So that people could see their fingerprints in the master plan, but even more importantly, uh, they could create a process that would ensure that they get to come back every two years or so to shift or change it so that it is meeting their needs. This goes right at the heart of what Jim is saying. So they get to interrogate, for instance, uh, major developments. They get to interrogate uh, uh, community design. These are not the kind of things that you think about from a justice perspective or economic dignity perspective, but it's also critically important where those bodies exist to be able to, um, to push people inside of those processes. And the last thing I'll mention is where those bodies don't exist, there's still important work. So the state of yeah. Louisiana does not have a formal planning body to think about statewide, as, as we all know, disasters don't um, observe you know, parish or county lines and things of that nature. So we don't actually have a, an oversight and, and a sort of overlay from a planning perspective. It's a patchwork. It really does undermine equitable recovery efforts and a way of thinking about these lessons that we've got. Jim, there was a point you uh, brought up early, um, which was uh, about reconsidering the timeline under which we are uh, evaluating recovery or you know, evaluating how people are, are doing or after disaster, I'm curious, uh, and I want to ask this to, to, to all three of you uh, who are on, um, what is a, a good time frame for thinking about the effects of disaster? I mean, I think like we, we, we understand now that 15 years give us a bit of a better vantage at long term, uh, well, the, the effects of wealth. Uh, but also I'm thinking about like the intergenerational aspects of, uh, of being denied uh, a chance at recovery or, or, you know, having, being able to get your house back, you know, you, you give that to your kids. Um, what is out there in the research that, that we should be thinking about in terms of our time, our lens of time, our time horizon and uh, thinking about recovery? Yeah, that's, um, that's a great question, Ben. Um, I don't know that there's a lot of good research out there other than to, you know, basically make the point that there are multiple recoveries, that recovery is a process, not an end state. And what are you trying to recover? And I would say that the recovery fundamentally is about when we're committing public resources like taxpayer dollars and um, insurance funds that are being, you know, paid across the country or pouring that into an area, that what we need to think about is rebuilding the social infrastructure. 
Um, we rebuild, we're pretty good at rebuilding the physical infrastructure, but how do you rebuild the social infrastructure? And in that, it, that's going to depend on how successful people are, but holding folks, the recovery machine, as I've called it in some places, the, the players who are involved in the planning that Bozell mentions, holding them accountable that says, okay, here are the benchmarks. After year one, we want to see stocks of affordable housing go up, not down. Uh, we want to see minority business formation and profitability go up, not down. We want to see public investments in underserved communities and inclusion to the table so they get resources to decide how they're going to uh, rebuild themselves. And that's my act of hope with verification. Get data on it. And if you don't meet benchmarks by year one, two, three, four, five, guess what? You're off and someone else comes in and the money gets redistributed. If you're down on those deficits, then guess what? Some of that money that was going to go to the physical infrastructure gets re-diverted to the social infrastructure because that's ultimately the most important thing. And then the timeline becomes a function of how successful people are able to do that. Uh, Pam, you just muted yourself. <laughs> I'm kind of nervous about a timeline, right? Because when we first got into this work at Katrina, people were saying to me, oh, it'll be 10 years. Don't even think about it, Pat. You know, you have to wait a decade. But if you take Jim's point that if certain things happen and it's done in a way that's verifiable and accountable and equitable, we have no idea how long it will take because we've never done that. So to, to force a timeline on something um, makes me nervous. I, I much prefer this kind of incremental thing, this incremental analysis that, that, to go forward. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I agree with Pam, matching that with Jim's prior comment about multiple recoveries and, and these sort of, what did you say, Jim, about these sort of tales and these, this overlapping, the, the, the complexity of what happens even in a community like New Orleans or Louisiana, where you have uh, Katrina Rita, Gustav Ike, BP, um, other things, and now we're in the middle of this global pandemic, which also has, uh, you know, an economic uh, sort of cataclysm happening all at the same time. You, you don't get the nice and tidy timeline. I do wonder, though, if history has something to teach us. Um, I think about these things in the context of the impossible work that becomes possible or, or, or that gets done. And so whether your lens is um, uh, suffrage or um, civil rights or LGBTQ rights or labor rights or um, housing rights, um, indigenous rights, environmental justice issues, I think across America's history, we see time and time again, when we come together around really difficult and disastrous issues um, and decide that we can make progress on them, we do get to set a timeline and we get to learn these lessons from history. And history is telling us, um, I think Pam, when we started at the, the Disaster Recovery Foundation, we thought 20 years, we thought this is a generation's worth of work if nothing else happens. Well, we didn't know all the other things <laughs> what happened, uh, it, but it does make me wonder if history isn't telling us that it's less of, um, what is it, a destination? It's more of a journey and how do you have milestones that really let you know, not only that you're getting more efficient and effective, but that you're creating systems that turn back injustice and inequality and that actually foment and support justice and equality, um, wealth building, access to democracy, and we can measure those things. So maybe it's a different way of measuring them. Yeah, the thing I think uh, uh, everybody I interviewed kept admonishing me about was not thinking about the end state, to not think about recovery as a state at all, right? To think about the process, to think about uh, what is good process, what is good sustainable and replicable process. Yeah. Um, and what process does bring uh, things like what, you, what you're calling economic dignity, um, how you bring that into the process and make it so it's sort of self-sustaining in the future, right? Yeah. I, I think one of the things that I wanted that um, 
I also have a bit of caution around as I'm listening to you. If you don't say, well, what's at the end of the rainbow, you run the risk of not having metrics and deliverables and milestones and ways mm -hmm. of measuring whether the process is moving in the right direction and is doing what you want it to do. So I, th I think we can acknowledge and, and interrogate that complexity and also add to that not only um, an analysis about, about why it takes so long, but to discover ways that we can accelerate or leapfrog in some of these instances. So one of the things that we're really interested in and have been uh, finding some success in around the things that build family and community resilience is if we can do, do something at scale, whether it's reduce incarceration, increase affordable home ownership um, um, availability and things of that nature, working with government to get the kind of scale that the private sector and nonprofit sector struggles with, then we see real acceleration in outcomes. And I could give you some examples, but one of the things that we found in New Orleans is that we were the most incarcerated city in the world the day Katrina hit. That had a real impact on the, the baseline of recovery for us. And we are now, we're not even in the top 25. We've reduced the size of the jail and we've improved our criminal justice system in a way that really does set families up to be stronger. Again, it's 20 years worth of work, but you can see real measurable outcomes. I wonder if there's a way for us to interrogate ways to use scale uh, to shorten the timeline and to accelerate some of the outcomes that we're looking for. I want to bring in a couple more uh, clips from uh, the show um, that I think are just going to guide the last bit of our conversation. Uh, first things first, since you all aren't uh, hearing from General Honoré, I am going to bring in the clip of him uh, cussing for a little bit. So um, please just bear with me. Officials were calling for a military response. They got one, just not quite the one they expected. I love fucking problems like this. I thrive on shit like this. Part five, Exodus. So that was how we introduced the general to the show. Um, <laughs> I thought it, all of you who know him uh, and who have talked uh, with General Honoré, it, uh, it, it's a good encapsulation of our conversation and I was grateful to have him on with us. Um, I think uh, what I want to do with the remainder of our time is a, a lot of folks are really in the chat uh, talking about how Katrina relates to other disasters. People have been talking about Galveston, been talking about uh, Maria, have been talking about earthquakes, and also uh, there's a lot of uh, focus on just how we apply this to the current pandemic. Um, and that is the elephant in the room right now for every single conversation about disasters. Uh, General Honoré, I, I want to bring you in. You've mentioned um, how we should be applying those first principles of disaster, of uh, how we respond to that initial um, lack of organization, the initial uh, shock phase and build a robust response. And I wanna hear from you about that in the, in, in the context of COVID-19. Yeah, I'll be quick. I, I think, uh, again, for this generation, if you watch this in relationship to watching disasters from Katrina forward to, uh, the earthquakes, I mean, fires and uh, bad the hurricanes we've had in 17, is that in a disaster, you have to have a need for speed. Speed saved lives. And there can only be one priority in a disaster, and this one, this pandemic, for which when I was on the Joint Chiefs of Staff and Commander of Joint Force Headquarters Homeland Security and Commander of First Army, we trained on significantly. And that in a pandemic, we knew it was going to be bad because there was a, a reluctance in our culture and in, in our government to quarantine. And it's still an ugly word, and, and it very seldom come up uh, in conversation, even today, in, in responding to the pandemic. And in essence, that's how South Korea and Thailand and other places that started off on the same day we started off, uh, they locked it down. You gotta have a need for speed. You gotta have a federal response. 
you got to recognize the severity of what we're dealing with and the pandemic. We, we all know that story. We watched the news and how it unfolded. And now it's gotten away from us um, to a point that more people are going to die because we didn't act with speed. We didn't use the federal authorities that were available. And again, I could go through a litany of what has not been done right. I think with the few seconds we have left, we need to look at what we need to do to move forward. We can't drive this bus out the ditch looking through the rearview mirror. And I think a way to do that is to generally go with public health, what has been stated over and over again. Uh, wear the mask, wash your hands, stay home, uh, protect the vulnerable, and shut it down in the red zones. And then we've got to get the tests, the tracing, and the supported isolation. Supported isolation is where we take people, once they come up positive and they don't have a way to go, we put them in a government secured place that's paid for where they can not go home to grandma and grandpa. They go to a hotel that's sponsored by the government and they sequester there and people bring them food, nurses check on them uh, and see if they recover or do they need to go to a hospital. We have not gotten that done. And the federal response has been let the states handle it. You don't let states do certain things. There's a reason we don't let every governor decide what time the damn airplanes take off from the airports in their state. You with me? Because they run over each other in the sky. There's certain things best done by the federal government. And this testing, tracing, and um, supported isolation has to be federally supported and executed by the state. And we're still struggling with this Going back to, you know, the, 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 the Mark event, Katrina, and what we learned coming here that would have made us better handle this response. So we've got to federalize the logistics, the PPE, uh, and the testing and the tracing, and the support uh, functions that's needed to do that. And we need to nationalize a message where there's one message coming out and going back to Katrina, no more priority or what? Saving lives. It's not save lives, save the economy. Because when you have that conversation, economy wins. It's save lives. Because if we had saved lives, we'd be like South Korea now. We'd be walking around chilling. Everybody talking about where they're going on vacation. It ain't happening. Because we did not put save lives first. When I say we, the government, the central government in Washington, they put politics and economy over saving lives. And we've got a hundred, almost 40,000 of our people dead. And I, I'm by the back of the envelope, I think we'll end up with 400,000 people dead by Christmas. <coughs> if we don't shut it down. Mm -hmm and then do the tracing and federalize the testing because every governor, the 50 state solutions don't work. Every governor, brother-in-law or college classmate who has a lab is testing. Mm -hmm. Some of them take seven days, some take five days. Some of them have a 40% accuracy. Some of them have a 50% accuracy. Some of them have a 95% accuracy. But when you contract that out at the state level, this is what we got. And none of them want to change now because their buddy got the contract. We're going to have to go in and clean this up. And we need to do it now because it's going to get worse before it gets better. As the cold weather come mm -hmm. and the flu season get mixed in with a cough and a fever and, and sinus, it's going to be a, a S show. I'll just say it that way. So the go. people will have to get a movement. We're going to have to get a movement, otherwise our grandparents are going to continue to die at an enormous rate. Grandparents, we're going to lose a generation. Mm -hmm. We're going to lose the rest of the, the veterans from World War II and Korea and deep into the Vietnam, if I use that as a generational thing, of what will be going by Christmas because this pandemic has a bigger impact on them.
and we need a social change for the 18 to 30 year old to tell them, and I'm just gonna say it, they need to stay their ass home. People have done a lot worse. Previous generations got picked up from high school generation and went to Vietnam or to Korea, World War II and World War I. You need to talk to them like adults. They need to stay their ass home and they need to go vote. Only 30% of them voted in the last election. So mm. they want to be adults. They want to go on the beach. They want to have the drink party. They're bringing that stuff home to grandma and grandpa. And, and that's the people that's dying at a higher rate. Hey, I'm 31. I'm at home. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, you pass the word to your brothers. I will sisters. do so. Uh, but we've got to be advocates of that, sir. And I understand it's not everybody, but that is what's coming out in big data as to where the, the virus is passing through that generation at a higher rate to the people that it have a devastating impact on killing. So those are the things I think we need to do now is to uh, federalize the response in terms of logistics and, and, and give the governors what they need to do the, uh, the HERO program, but they're funding the cities that no longer have money. The cities are broke. When I got to New Orleans, the mayor of New Orleans told me the week after I was there, he couldn't make payroll. I said, well, man, why are you telling me? I'm a federal officer. He said, well, the president said to tell you if there's anything I needed, just tell you. He said, I need money. I can't make payroll next week. <laughs> so <clears throat> got a hold of the White House. They called the bank, told the banks to cover his payroll. I saw the mayor the next day. He said, man, you took care of that. I got other stuff I want you to do. What? I said, how did you end up with no money, man? He said, when the cash register stopped, General, the city stopped collecting money, and we went into disaster with 10 days cash. That's right. 10 yeah. days cash. That's what the city went into that disaster with. Mm -hmm. And you got cities that way all over the country. Thank you. Yeah. You mentioned one thing that I, I really want to bear down on. Um, it, of course, right now, the people who are dying, and, and that's you know partly because of the biology of the, of the virus and its uh, effects on the body are, are older folks. But that's also in part because that's what happens in every disaster, right? It's people who are older, people who are on the margins, uh, people who don't have the ability to go, uh, who don't have a support network, and they tend to be older. Uh, it, but it's been wild to me as a member of the media seeing us with so many different disasters under our belts, with so many different times going through this rodeo, always, you know, we never retain anything. Everybody's like, oh my God, we can't believe that vulnerable people are vulnerable. Yeah. <laughs> how, do, how do we, I, I'm asking for advice as a journalist. Um, maybe you have, maybe you've been yelling at the news uh, and, and you can take it out on me now. Um, are there better ways for us to actually build uh, intergenerational memory about disaster that, that, that help us be more nimble and quick, as you say, uh, to responding. And that's anybody who wants to answer. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in, in New Orleans, the first big outbreak was in, in a nursing home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. First big outbreak in, uh, we had a lot of deaths in what the state of Washington was in a nursing home. It took another 45 days before the leadership at the national and at the state level realized, oh, we got a problem in nursing home. We had a veterans home in Laplace, like 125 veterans in there. 27 of them dead in one week. Now we knew there was a problem with nursing homes in Washington, which had over 40 days earlier. 30 mm -hmm. days earlier, we had a problem in New Orleans with nursing home. It's like, come on, guys, let's get in the front of the, you know, we, we can't let the virus get in front of us. We got to stop playing defense and stop playing offense. Because all the news was sucked out to full up hospital rooms. What we didn't see is the people that were dying before they got to the hospital and the people in the nursing home where information was allowed to be sequestered because the nursing home operator, he get paid for breathing bodies. 
when he ship him off to the hospital, there's no more income coming for him. Mm -hmm. It's called disaster capitalism. And it took yeah, a while for the government to get their head around after it was so embarrassing to the government to see a generation dying in nursing home that what in the hell is going on? And you went in there, none of the CDC protocols were being followed. Yeah. When the disaster come, you circle the ring around where the poor people are and where the elderly, and that's where most of the people are going to die. I mean, we should be teaching that in Disaster 101. You don't need a PhD in disaster response to figure that out. Right. But in parents, it's less than the government hadn't learned yet. Yeah. Most of the people who died in Katrina were elderly, disabled, and poor. And they were by themselves. So we still haven't fixed the problem with what's the address of the grandma that lives by herself uh, in, the, in the Civil War. Mm -hmm. So we make sure we evacuate her before the hurricane comes. That still had not been fixed. Mm -hmm. We've talked about it, but it had not been fixed. Because if we get another Katrina, there still is the vulnerable population, the elderly, disabled, and the poor. Yeah. I want to, uh, we, we are coming up on uh, the outer bounds of our time. Um, I want to thank you all for, for, for joining us. Um, I always learn, um, a I learn a lot more every time I read you all, every time I talk to you all, uh, every time I just soak up information. Um, I, I, I'm hoping there's some way I can copy and paste all the comments because I just like saw four or five research papers that are going to be crucial to my <laughs> reporting. Um, I do want to close with one question uh, to Pam. Um, and, you know, just, just very quickly, this session is titled Katrina at 15, uh, looking back to move forward. But I want to think about what at this, uh, when we were talking about Katrina at 30, when we're talking about maybe Katrina at 45, maybe 50. What do you think are going to be the eternal or lasting truths about that, that that's inform us the most about uh, fundamentally what uh, disasters are and what recovery is? Mute it again. Amy, you're muted. I'm going to unmute. You're, you're muted, Pam. You're muted. Okay. There we Thank go. you. Um, I won't cry on this answer, Van. Um, <laughs> if we can take the words of wisdom that I'm sure we have collected throughout, I'm trying to read these comments, and think about how we go forward listening to the general and Flozell and Jim about equitable response and recovery. If we're really going to save lives, we have to do it at the response, do exactly what he said, surround the houses of the, of the most vulnerable and take care of them first. But if we can learn that what the disasters really do is take the veil off of our culture to show us how deep the inequality is in our day-to-day -day lives. So for me, disasters just show us that. And if we can take that knowledge we get to go forward to create more equitable responses and more equitable, equitable systems when there's not a disaster, that we've really, we will be more successful in the way that we go forward. Now we just, as my friend Steve Krollsmith says, we recover inequality after each disaster. So I would like to recover something else. I'd like to recover equality. Wow, that was, a, I think that's an excellent way to, 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 to close this out. I want everybody to uh, make sure um, after this, you head on over to the final closing session uh, um, where uh, Laura will be giving closing remarks. And um, yeah, I just want to thank everybody for coming. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, this was riveting. And as always, I've learned quite a bit. So thank you. Do we stay right here to listen to Lori, or do we got to go to another connection? Um, I think you uh, hop out of here, but I am not the authority. You do hop out. You, okay. you hop out. You hop out, then Thank you come you back guys. You were yeah. so great, all of you. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. You got to hop out and come back in. Yes, I think so. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna post the URL to the next session right here if you want to copy that. Um, that'll just maybe be the easiest way for you just to jump over there. So it's in the comments. So I just put it in the comments to join mm -hmm. the next webinar. How do we? I couldn't read these comments. Are we going to be able to get them? Yeah, Pam, I'm downloading them right now, and then we're going to post both the video and the comment chats um, to the session page, and they'll also be up on our website within the next week because we'll have to do some video editing and stuff, but um, we'll definitely have those up soon, and I can send them to your internal panel even much sooner than that if you'd like. Great. Well, sweet. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for a great panel. Y'all take care. Thank you, y'all.